All right, we are uh, live for part two uh, of Colonel Wal Lieutenant Colonel Walcock joining us for uh, <clears throat> for his presentation, and uh, we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off uh, last uh, last stream on part one. Uh, I believe that was slide nine, and I am going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Walcock to uh, start us off. I am pleased to be with you again. Uh, just to start off, I was uh, in MACV SOG running recon beginning in uh, March of 1969 and continued doing that for about 25 months until uh, May of uh, 71. Uh, I'm, uh, believe it or not, three quarters of a century old at this point in my life. And it's my ambition to kind of leave a legacy behind uh, to better inform special operations personnel in particular, but, but other troops as well, uh, particularly in the United States, but among our allies uh, and it would please me no end that if we get into combat uh, anywhere in the world and where special forces uh, are deployed and we're using uh, special reconnaissance, that I'll get a call from somebody out of the blue or an email and say, thank you, you saved my life, you saved the lives of my team members. Uh, or something like, who is this guy Wolkoff? He saved all these lives. God bless him, you know, and you need to read his book. Uh, and that would be my, my leave behind. That would be my legacy uh, where special operators are more survivable, more lethal, and have better operational success. At any rate, when we left off uh, during the first podcast, this was the slide that was presented at that point. Uh, so we're gonna to progress to the next slide. Okay. Now, I had mentioned in, in the previous podcast that uh, it was occasionally very difficult for helicopters to land in a rainforest environment. Landing zones were scarce. Some landing zones were very marginal. Some landing zones were so vertical that you couldn't actually land the helicopter. You had to either use ladders or ropes uh, for extraction or insertion. Now, here's an example uh, where a, uh, a ladder is being used on an extraction. The uh, SOG ladder was fabricated under the guidance of Norman Doney, who was at that point in time a master sergeant at CCC. And he had taken uh, the position of first sergeant of the recon company. His previous assignment was at uh, Project Delta, uh, otherwise known as B-52. Uh, and he had these things fabricated and it, you may not be able to see it, uh, but those are, those lateral rungs are made from aluminum. Uh, and they were strung between wire cable. Uh, very sturdy. And these were for LZs where 
the length of the ladder was sufficient in order to pick up or, or leave off a team. I personally never used it for an insertion, uh, but I used it on several occasions on extraction. In this particular photo, you'll notice that there's a helicopter crewman who's helping a wounded uh, member of my team into the uh, cargo compartment of the UH-1D helicopter. Uh, I want to point out that we had absolutely stellar aviation support. These people were well into the mission. Uh, I want to call them out in particular. So, and I'll, and I'll tell a little interesting little story. So when I first got there, uh, we were using uh, UH-1C, UH-1 Charlie model helicopters as gunships. They were underpowered, particularly if they have, had to climb into, a, you know, above mountainous terrain. Uh, they didn't carry, uh, a, you know, a great deal of ordnance. Uh, and they were subsequently replaced by Cobra helicopters, which were excellent, absolutely excellent. Uh, and I recommend that you go online and take a look at what the, the, the Cobra helicopter looked like and its armament. Uh, it was a fantastic aircraft and, and remains a fantastic aircraft right now, serving the Marines in particular. Uh, and that started out as the uh, 190th Buccaneers who provided UH-1D uh, assault helicopter company that was uh, our, you know, the primary insertion aircraft for us. And uh, initially, they were the, the 57th uh, aviation company uh, or assault aviation company. Uh, and these guys were excellent. They loved the mission. They were the only company within their battalion that wanted to do this mission because this mission was all volunteer. Uh, and one day the uh, commanding general of the first field force, Vietnam, paid them an unexpected visit. The members of the, uh, the aviation company had adopted some of our practices. Some of them wore black fatigue, some of them wore earrings. Uh, the general was not pleased. He thought that the, uh, the 57th had been supporting special forces too long uh, and that he wanted to get them back into the army. So he directed that the 57th be reassigned and they bring in another helicopter company. That didn't work out too well. I mean, another helicopter company didn't want to volunteer for this mission. So what actually happened was all the personnel within the 57th transferred to the new helicopter company and the personnel who were in the that helicopter, which was the 170th, wound up in the 57th and were redeployed elsewhere in, in Vietnam in support of the 4th, uh, the 4th Infantry Division. Uh, these guys were, uh, were terrific. Uh, we also had in support uh, the uh, 20th TAS, which is the Air Force unit that provided uh, forward air controllers. Uh, we referred to them as Covey aircraft. They were excellent. They were heavily into the mission. Um, they really connected with us, although we weren't co-located with them. Uh, they, they loved supporting us. They really had an affinity for, for the operation. Uh, we also got support from the Vietnamese, 
aviation unit called the 219th, which flew CH-34 helicopters. Those were old helicopters. They were not turbine uh, helicopters, but they were, and they only had one exit for cargo. Uh, but they were a terrific, uh, very robust rotary engine, uh, you know, cylinder engine uh, up located up front in the front of the helicopter. The pilots were located up over the engine. Uh, very strong uh, uh, helicopter, cargo hel helicopter. And uh, their pilots were very ballsy. Uh, we also had in support uh, A-1 attack aircraft from the 22nd or the 602nd Special Operations Squadron. These guys were also heavily in to the, the mission uh, and uh, would do anything for us. Uh, they would fly low and slow and drop enormous amounts of ordnance in, in protection of, uh, uh, of a, a team in trouble uh, or uh, directed against, you know, in airstrikes against the enemy. In later years, I didn't, you know, we, again, we weren't co-located with them. We were located in Docto. The 57th and the 170th uh, assault helicopter companies were located at Docto, but their parent unit, their battalion was located at Pleiku. So, and the Cobras were located at, at Pleiku as well. So the only unit that was, you know, located in the vicinity uh, were the uh, assault helicopter companies, you know, the UH-1Ds. Delta Project had a, a different uh, approach. Their cover pi cubby pilots were co-located with them. They lived in the same barracks. Uh, they went to the same club. They drank with uh, the teams that they supported. Uh, and they grew a very close relationship. We didn't have that opportunity to have our aviators co-locate with us except for the CH-34s, but they usually hung out with the Vietnamese uh, troops located on FOB-2. So we didn't intermingle with them, but they were extremely courageous. Over the course of years, uh, former members of SOG established a fraternal organization called the Special Operations Association. And over the course of time, it took years for us to reconnect with some of the aviators who supported us. I went to a, a couple of uh, their presentations, and I will tell you that those surviving members of the assault helicopter companies, and in particular, the A-1 pilots got extremely emotional during their presentations. They felt such an affinity for us. They felt sorry for us. They could not imagine the kind of things that we were going through. Uh, and uh, they told us some of the things that they had to do in order to provide us close air support. It was, uh, I can't imagine having better support than these air aviation units that we had. Next slide. Also, what further about? You're breaking up. Oh, uh, one good, good thing about the uh, another group that supported it was uh, Rotary Wing was the 219 headhunter. 
the uh, spats who uh, also flew visual reconnaissance, uh, but occasionally fly cubby uh, for free all. That's correct. We had one bird dog that supported us. Uh, and we also got occasional support from a larger Vietnamese aircraft that was used for target areas that were further distant from us. Uh, the bird dog was the original FAC aircraft. It was the 01 bird dog. Uh, and uh, originally it didn't carry any armament, but then they w wound up getting um, rocket launchers on the wings. And ultimately, some of them actually put, uh, I mean, those rockets were typically marking rounds using white phosphorus, but some of them would actually load up flechette rounds when they went on photographic missions. And if they saw a target of opportunity, they would come down and, and shoot at it with the rocket launchers. Uh, and they didn't have any sight system on them. So what the, what the pilot did was he put a, he used a, uh, a grease pencil to put a mark on his windshield as an aiming point, <laughs> a field expedient. Okay, so what you see here in this particular slide is what what the uh, the ladder actually looked up, uh, looked like uh, in uh, closer relief, and it was this is hanging down so that you can just get a better look at it. But normally it was rolled up inside uh, the cargo space of the aircraft and for an insertion or an extraction. Well, for an insertion, uh, you would actually have to sit on top of those, so those rolled up ladders. Uh, and for an extraction, uh, they typically did not pull the ladders in. Often, uh, teams were so exhausted uh, that they uh, they couldn't climb the ladder. So they would actually hook into the ladder on those vertical cables uh, with carabiners. Any questions? So I was at you already. Let me uh, go back to the top real quick. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, one was, uh, wasn't really anything recovered, but it, it's a fairly good question. Um, no one's marauders is uh, asking about something in your book. Uh, in, in your book, you recommend coming up with your own hand signal. If you use any any specific hand signal? If so, do you remember any that you did? Yeah, I can answer that question, but I, I should note that your uh, audio I'm receiving from you is not very clear. So I'm, I'm missing some words. Okay, so I don't know if you can clear that up or not. Uh, there were a, a number of... Uh, hand and arm signals. We didn't, some of the hand and arm signals that you find in a field manual were not appropriate to what we were doing. So we had to invent our own. Uh, so for instance, uh, if uh, one of the Montagnards heard running water, he would make a, a hand, hand signal like this. I can see if you indicating uh, you know a stream and then would point to his ear uh, if there was a snake it would be I don't know, let's see. 
you know, kind of like a snake-like motion. Uh, if he saw an enemy, he would do a point, you know, a hand down, point, your thumb down kind of thing. A lot of these were just instinctive. If a team member wasn't paying attention, there was a number of things. That, there was a couple of things that you could do. You could throw a twig at him if a twig was handy to get his attention. Uh, or you could make an animal-like sound. There was a lizard that was in South Vietnam that kind of make it, made a squeak. So you could replicate that squeak pretty accurately. And it sounded like... Just like that. So you could, you could get somebody's attention by making that sound. But that, that lizard was so prolific... Uh, in Southeast Asia that uh, if an enemy heard that sound, it, it wouldn't mean anything to him at all. Uh, there were other signs uh, that we could use, like uh, this might be an artillery piece, that might be an anti-aircraft piece, That would mean uh, get into a uh, defensive perimeter. Sometimes the hand and arm signals were accompanied by uh, mouthed words that would be directed at Americans if they if it lacked clarity. You typically wouldn't speak at all during the entirety of the mission unless it was at a whisper. And the only time you could whisper to somebody was during a, a halt where you would go up to him and whisper in his ear or when you were in a defensive perimeter and you could get close enough to whisper in his ear. But otherwise, words never were never used. It was the strangest sound that you ever heard was when you came back from an operation after a week of not speaking and to hear the sound of your own voice. It was really weird. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, th th there was one more question uh, before we get into the next one, if you uh, didn't mind knocking out real quick. Uh, this one is... Uh, not really associated with the slide or anything, but just a, a curious question. Um, Ricardo wants to know, um, how were you and the your SOG colleagues perceived and perceived when y'all were at, by other U.S. personnel uh, at non-SF bases uh, or other bases that y'all happened to, uh, to visit or launch out of or, or help out at? Uh, Michael, author Michael Hurd talked about a uh, near mythic view of the words and assuming the same thing as Matt we saw. Uh, largely, other units really did not know about our mission. Uh, here's a little story that's, that's kind of interesting. I was in the afternoon with two other recon guys. One of them was guy by the name of Dave Baker, who was team leader of our team, Maine. And we were sitting, I, I, would, I, I never drank alcohol, so I was drinking a Coke, and those two other guys from our team, Maine, were you know, drinking a beer. And uh, in comes, into, our, into the club comes a couple of guys from the 4th Infantry Division recon unit. Fourth Infantry Division had divisional recon company assigned to them. Uh, and they sat in the table next to us. One was a rather slender guy. He was the more senior of the two. And the other guy was a young guy, very powerfully built. Uh, 
And he, he started making sneering comments about us, basically saying, you know, do you guys ever do any combat? You know, I mean, I, all you do is train Montenegrins. Do you actually go to the field? And his companion was giving him the elbow, trying to tell him to shut his mouth. And the guy, you know, wouldn't do it. So Baker turns around to him and says, yeah, we hear about you recon guys. You're really uh, very impressive. Uh, we hear that sometimes you go outside of uh, 82 millimeter mortar range. And the guy was very cockily said, yeah, sometimes we go outside of 105 millimeter howitzer range. And the guys at my table, we all kind of smiled and, and, and snickered. Uh, finally, this guy's companion leaned over to him and told him what we did in a whisper. He says, these guys go to Laos and they run recon in Laos. He knew about us, but most, most other people didn't. Well, this guy shut up. He got very flushed and embarrassed. They finished their beer and left uh, with a cloud hanging over them. And I'm sure that when they got back, uh, this uh, this new recon guy was uh, rid ridiculed. Uh, there were a few people. I mean, there was a uh, a B team located uh, in uh, Contum. Uh, and comprised of you know special forces people, and of course they all knew what we were doing. And there were some other people. I mean, there was a uh, an interrogation center operated by the CIA that was located in Khantoum, and they knew what we were doing. Uh, but by and large, conventional troops had no like, had no clue. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It, it very much does. Um, guys, uh, I'm writing these questions down for later on, uh, but uh, considering uh, we've got one last easy question that pertains before we go to the next slide, um, Daniel wanted to know uh, uh, with the ladder that we're looking at right here, um, yes, could it you be rolled up in flight if everyone yes. got on it, yes. it, could, okay. it, was, it was pretty cumbersome to do that. Uh, but yes, you could do that. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'll be uh, some of the weapons. And uh, uh, actually, there is one more. And guys, I'll get to the other ones next. But uh, th what was your preferred uh, methods of extraction if you had to be extracted? Uh, th they talked about in Meyer and class was book, and he mentions the jungle penetrator. Uh, what did you prefer? Uh, the. Uh... I never saw a jungle penetrator deployed unless it was on a uh, Jolly Green Giant Air Force helicopter. Uh, typically, uh, Army helicopters didn't use those. CCS had Air Force uh, Huey support using a more advanced and more powerful uh, Hughes aircraft that probably had a jungle penetrator, but we didn't use them at all. Uh, we had uh, three extraction rigs that could be used with rope extractions. When I first got there, we were using something called the McGuire rig, which is actually uh, just a, uh, a nylon strap formed into a large loop and connected to uh, a rope that was then connected in, you know, in, inside the aircraft, you know, tied down inside the aircraft. The loop itself had a D ring at its bottom where you'd be sitting, where you could attach uh, your rucksack. It also had uh, a loop up near the top where you could 
insert your wrist and uh, to keep you from falling out uh, of the uh, nylon loop. And uh, the strap was usually padded down where you'd be seated. So that worked fine until we had to extract a uh, helicopter pilot whose aircraft had been shot down. And he had not been trained on the McGuire rig. He thought that it was used like the, uh, the donuts that were used for sea rescue, where the loop would fit underneath your arms and you'd be hauled up that way. But what happened to him was the, the strap cut into his arms and into his circulation. He lost all feeling in his arms. And he fell out of the loop uh, at uh, several thousand feet above ground level uh, and died. So we stopped using that. But around the same time frame where the McGuire rig was used, we also used something called the Hansen rig. The Hansen rig, again, used a, a nylon strap. Uh, but this was carried on your person, whereas the McGuire rig was, you know, you deployed from the helicopter. And it was basically formed into a large loop that would hang from your shoulder. The bottom of the loop would be down by your feet. And you would reach between your legs and grab that strap. And basically it would form a cradle, almost like a Swiss seat. And it would be very difficult to fall out of a Hansen rig. The good part about the, uh, the Hansen rig uh, is it had multiple functions. So if you got a sucking chest wound, and you had to seal the wound, uh, and you had an entrance and an ex ex exit wound, you could put bandages over the wound, but then you would have to find a way to keep those bandages on there while you're moving the, the casualty through the jungle. So you could act this. The strap was so long that you could actually use it to bind the bandages around your chest. It could also be used so you could take it out of its loop configuration and use it to haul people up out of rivers or up over stream banks or up steep terrain. It was usually around 12 to 16 feet long. Uh, and it had, uh, it had other functions as well if you, if you needed to do a field expedient raft, you could use that to do that. If you had a captured POW, uh, that was one way to get him up. Uh, it was also useful for wounded people. The McGuire rig was not uh, very uh, kind to uh, people who were wounded because you would typically faint while you were in the harness and then you'd be wind up hanging by your wrist from, from the wrist strap. If you give me a moment, I can actually show you what it, what the uh, Hansen rig looked like. Excellent. We're uh, going to get to see something here uh, straight from uh, Mr. Ed's uh, war room here. I think guys, uh, I don't even think I've seen what he's about to show. So, uh, get ready for this. And uh, we've, uh, we've, we've got some good stuff coming up for uh, the next couple slides. So uh, this will be good. So this is not a Hansen rig, but it uses the same strap that you would find. Okay. And it had a very heavy duty buckle on it. And this was usually... Uh, and its original configuration was called an A7A strap, which was an Air Force cargo tie-down strap that came in 20-foot lengths and, and things like that. The breaking weight of this 
uh, material was 4,000 pounds and the breaking weight of the buckle was 4,000 pounds. So you could actually use it uh, as a belt uh, and use it for emergency extraction if you didn't have anything else available. The third extraction rig was the Stabo rig, which basically used straps and it's replaced the load bearing harness uh, that was issued to troops, commonly issued to troops. So we replaced the H harness with nylon straps that were looped through, it had loops in it where the uh, your pistol belt would loop through it. And then it had straps in the back, which you could unravel and clip onto D rings under uh, up through your crotch and, and then the front of the front of the harness. And then it also had two straps at the shoulder level that you could extend up and hook on to an, you know, the uh, something that was, you know, a, a rig that was lowered to you. So you had two hook on points. And the advantage of that was that you could actually fire your weapon uh, while you're being extracted. It was, and you couldn't fall out of it. What I, I couldn't use it because I carried a machine gun and, uh, and a lot of ammunition, uh, which required a particular load bearing rig. Uh, and I find, found that they were uncomfortable. You had to modify it to put a pad on it, but the pad was never seemed to be sufficient to bear the weight that you would carry on your pistol belt. So I never used it, but the rest of my team did. Okay. So that answers that question. If you want to go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, did you want that one or the, the next one out of the jungle? Are you having problems getting this line up? Uh, no, sir. Were, were you wanting uh, the the heavy vegetation or? Yes. Yes, okay. the heavy vegetation slide. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So this is considered heavy vegetation under medium canopy. Medium canopy meaning in some cases you can actually see the ground. Uh, Maybe you have one or two layers of canopy. Uh, there may be some breaks in the canopy. It, you can see how thick that is. And the only way you can move through that canopy and still be silent is move very, very slowly. So the standard pace for recon team in our area of operations was one kilometer a day. Um, every hour you would of, of movement, you would take a 10 minute break and then you would take a midday break uh, to make a communication check and you would move again and reestablish a, another perimeter to have your meal break. Then you would commence movement again until dusk, where you would then again have your second communication break of the day and then move again to a night defensive perimeter. So that was very, very slow pace because this vegetation was so dense that you could literally come face to face with an enemy almost at at the outreach of, of an arm and not even see them until because there would be an intervening bush that was a, with dense vegetation on it. I mean, it is incredibly dense vegetation. 
This is the kind of vegetation that was, is widespread in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and this would, I mean, there's, there's areas in, in temperate climes that have heavy vegetation, but I don't think you'd find too much like this. Uh, you find more vegetation near streams, of course. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is a jungle ravine under light canopy. You have a slope to the left, you have a slope to the right. Uh, you can see the sky, which is, in my experience, was unusual unless you were at an LZ, uh, landing zone. So if you were a team leader, and this is what you see before you, which side of the ravine would you choose to, to, uh, to move through? You wouldn't want to move through the ravine itself. You would want to be up on the shoulders of the ravine on the slopes. So I'll answer the question for you, which is if you look to the right-hand side of this slide, you see through the trees illumination. And that would indicate to me as a team leader that there's a potential LZ there. So I would always want to be I wouldn't want the enemy between me and an LZ. I would want to, to be on the side of uh, the terrain where I could reach an LZ without having to, to fight my way through to it. Okay. Any questions on, on this? Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Nothing right now, just people commenting on how heavy vegetation is for the uh, It's fine. Let's see what. Because of triple canopy. And sometimes more than three layers of canopy, actually. At night, you literally could not see your hand in front of your face. I mean, even at three inches, even at two inches, you could not see your hand in front of your face. The only illumination you could see at night under triple canopy was rotting vegetation, which would, in some cases, develop a luminescence. That's the only thing you could see. Uh, so here's a view from the Leghorn radio relay site located on a mountaintop uh, in the southeast corner of Laos. Uh, and it gave, a, you know, a great view of continuous canopy from all directions. And you can see how heavily dissected the terrain is here. Mountains, ravines, hills and ridges. Very difficult. The radio relay site was also manned by a small contingent uh, from the Army Security Agency, which was a military component of the National Security Council, uh, correction, National Security Agency. And it was their task to monitor enemy communications. And they were very discreet, highly classified, and I wouldn't want their job to be on top of a mountain uh, for a month at a time before being swapped out with somebody else.
the uh, the peak at Leghorn was occasionally used as an advanced operation base or a launch site, a subsidiary launch site where a team would be dropped off and there was a trail from the top of the mountain down to the bottom of the mountain. Uh, this area was so rugged and so remote that I don't think any team that did a walk down from Leghorn ever saw any enemy, but they did see elephants, interestingly enough. Okay, next slide. Having technical problems, bud? You're just now coming through. You were uh, you were silent there for a minute. Uh, I'm waiting for the next slide. Okay. I uh, this was this was the next one. I didn't know if you wanted to skip it or not. Uh, uh, here's the lava lava filled slides. Is that the one you were looking for? The one that says base areas. Yeah. Nope. One prior to that. Okay. So for some reason, a reason that I don't know. SOG did not use mission support sites or caches in their area of operations, in target areas that were where they routinely operated. Uh, that would have saved a lot of effort and it would have also provided uh, a capability for uh, evasion if, uh, if you got separated from your team you had to make your way out by foot, those kinds of things. There's some areas that are better for caches and mission support sites or unit hides for that matter than others. So if any of you have ever walked through Mountain Laurel, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you cannot move quickly through Mountain Laurel because it basically has tanglefoot beneath the leaves. Uh, they grow in every different kind of direction. And very difficult to get through patches of Mountain Laurel. The other interesting thing about Mountain Laurel is it's poisonous to uh, cattle. So you would want to have an area to hide in or to, or to place your supplies in that a civilian would avoid, uh, a farmer would avoid, a shepherd would avoid, and the enemy would avoid because it's difficult terrain to walk through. Soldiers are generally lazy I mean, you would rather walk through an easy path than through a mountain laurel patch. So mountain laurel is, uh, is a good place to put a cache or a unit hide uh, or a mission support site. And 
Mount Laurel is located worldwide, actually. Another is uh, a briar patch. No soldier wants to go through a briar patch for obvious reasons. But there are ways to actually to get through a briar patch without uh, losing too much blood, shall we say. Uh, and uh, you would also find uh, thorn bushes in Africa that had thorns that were half an inch to an inch long. And natives would often uh, cut these thorn bushes to create a barrier where they would camp, create a barrier around where they would camp to fend off predators like lions and so forth. They called them bomas. Uh, but unless the enemy knows that, absolutely knows that you're in there, he's not going to search. He's not going, his patrol is not going to move through a briar patch. So this is a good place to place your mission support sites and your caches. You always want to be where the enemy is going to avoid. So if you go back way back to Sun Tzu, who was a military commander in China before the birth of Christ, he wrote a book about you know, tactics and techniques called The Art of War. And a lot of the things that he has in that book are still relevant today. So one of the things he admonishes the reader to do is to avoid camping on the dark side of a ridge or a hill. Why? Because swarms of mosquitoes, stinging insects, leeches, they're all on the, the dark side of a ridge because that's where, it, where it's moist. So if you can abide the leeches and the mosquitoes and biting bugs, you can be generally comfortable that you're not going to run into an enemy while you're moving along uh, that kind of terrain. It's also good practice to research the flora that happens to be in your target area, your area of operation. Some, some uh, plants will cause severe skin irritation and things like that. So it's always prudent to, uh, to understand something about plant life. Uh, next slide. One question that pertained to uh, the, the mountain world was uh, that uh, we got a question about it. You said it was poisonous, and was that just the cattle? And how was it poisonous? Uh, one of the viewers ingestion. So ingestion. if they would eat it, if a if a cow or a goat or some other animal uh, would eat it. Uh, they, they would be poisoned by ingestion. It, it wasn't a contact uh, kind of a situation like poison ivy. All right, here we go with the next slide. Okay, here's another area that the enemy is going to avoid. These are found all over the uh, all over the world, with the exception, I think, of. Uh, uh, Antarctica. These are lava fields. And if you've never encountered a lava field, uh, let me kind of describe it to you. Uh, these are caused by lava flows. 
and there are air pockets that are created as the lava cools. Uh, and the lava has extremely sharp edges. So if, you're, if the enemy is using tracking dogs, one way to uh, brush him off is to move into a lava field carefully and find a place to sit down and establish a defensive position. Lava is often so sharp that it will also cut up uh, your boots. So I wouldn't recommend that, uh, lingering there too long. And the enemy will not move vehicles over lava fields, whether it happens to be wheeled vehicles or track vehicles, they will avoid that. So you see a lava field uh, in the uh, upper left, and then you see a, a smaller lava field in the lower left, which forms a pocket where you can actually stow uh, a cache. I wouldn't recommend that in particular, but stuff like that you can find it in the uh, this particular area was in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, you will also find, just looking at the illustration to the right, uh, a permanent feature. You always want to be able to reorient to a mission support site or, or a cache, something that's not going to change with the seasons. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to be a tree that might blow down. It's going to have to be something that's notable and something you can take an azimuth from. So for instance, here you're, you're seeing what used to be some steps uh, and the uh, and the base for for a building. That's a permanent marker, and from there you can measure off on an azimuth a certain number of steps, which will take you to where your cache is hidden. Next slide. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about micro terrain. So first on the left-hand side, you see an illustration of a saddle and a ravine. Uh, and that's what you're going to see on a map. You're going to see the, how the terrain is conformed by those contour interval lines. Uh, and uh, But that's not what you're going to see when you're on the ground. What you're going to see on the ground is the, the picture to the, to the right. So a skilled recon guy will know this. He'll know what to expect in the area of operations. And he'll know that a ravine is also populated with trees and shrubs and wait-a-minute vines and rocks and downfall, and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, so he will know when he gets on the ground, he gets off his helicopter onto the LZ, and he sets out on an azimuth, and he wants to use this ravine to climb up that saddle and get on the other side. That's what it's going to look like. He has that image in his mind already. Uh, now, micro terrain is really, you might call it surface disruptions that do not exceed three meters in height. So, less than a man uh, in uh, you know the height of a man, uh, and they can be like 
shallow depressions. It could be like you see here, there's some erosion off to the right of the, uh, of the ravine. You see rocks there. None of those things, and for, matter, for that matter, the trees, are not depicted on a map. All you'll see is what you see on the left. Now, you may, may see some coloration that indicates that there's vegetation or there's trees or things like that. Uh, but the density of the trees, what kind of trees, whether there's trees and shrubs or bamboo, a mixture of those, you're not going to see those on a standard NATO map. You might see them on an enemy map but you're not going to see it on a standard NATO map. So microterrain will provide you uh, a way to take cover when you come under fire. You're not going to be able to select your route in detail from the map that you see on left at the left. And you may not want to walk walk up uh, this uh, this ravine, and you see it's also marked with an intermittent intermittent stream. You might not want to walk up that uh, because there might be tree fall in the ravine, and it might make a lot of noise. So you might want to be on the slope to the left of the or to the right. I would say to the right because it's a shallower climb. So areas of surface roughness, roughness to include terrain form rubble that you see there. Uh, and uh, none of that is obvious on a map. Okay, any questions? On the past several slides. I know we've got um, one or two pertaining to uh, uh, back when we were talking about uh, triple canopy and uh, Two of them actually pertain to that, and um, one I'll kind of combine on um, what type of control measures would you use to keep you and your team on track? Uh, and, and the other question kind of says the same thing, meaning what 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 methods did you use to keep uh, track of everyone in triple canopy to where y'all would lose one another? Uh. We only used one formation uh, in uh, rainforest or jungle, and that was the, uh, the file formation. Control measures included three Americans to a 12-man team, or three Americans actually to a nine-man team. There's always three Americans normally assigned to a recon team. And... Uh, So if you couldn't see the last man in your file, hand and arm signals would be passed back, and that would happen fairly rapidly. I never had a problem in getting, the, you know, hand and arm signals relayed uh, to the twelfth man uh, on a team. Everybody on the team had an area of responsibility during movement, and they had an area of responsibility when they were in a perimeter. These are the kinds of things that were drilled, became second nature. And my rule was that if you're going to move your, your head and keep your head on a swivel and look around and observe Your, your surroundings. Every time you moved your head, every time you looked in a different direction, the muzzle of your weapon should should move along with it. Uh, that same kind of thing was done in a Cobra helicopter, where there's two people on board a Cobra helicopter. One is the uh, the pilot, and the other one is the gunner. And the gunner would have 
some of his weapon systems slaved to a heads up display on his on his helmet. So everywhere the gunner turned his head, the the weapon that was mounted in the nose, whether it was a uh, 40 millimeter uh, automatic automatic uh, gun or a uh, mini gun, would track whichever way his head would turn. That's the way my people were trained uh, to observe around them. Um, Got one more of it uh, pertains to uh, y'all's distancing uh, in the in the jungle. How, how much uh, distance between each man would y'all uh, It would typically be two arms lengths. Uh, but if you were in CCS's territory where vegetation was more sparse, you might want them, you know, greater separation. It depends on terrain and vegetation. Okay. So, uh, in my book, you'll see a number of ways to navigate cross country. Uh, and after a while on the ground, I found that this was the best way to navigate. If you understand where your insertion point is, if you have coordinates for that, then you can pick your route and identify terrain features that are gonna be along that route in order to keep yourself oriented rather than frequently stopping, taking out your compass, taking out your map. You can memorize like three terrain features along your projected route. So in this instance, you're going to see, you know, your next terrain feature is going to be a map check at an intermittent stream. So you're going to pr proceed along the slope of this ridge until you come to the intermittent stream. Then, then you know that your next map check is going to be a hilltop that's going to be to your right. So you memorize that terrain feature and you consider and you can continue walking along that that same ridge along the slope of that ridge and then you see there it is there's that saddle there's that uh, that hilltop and then you you realize that you're gonna you know, the third terrain feature that you've memorized is the next hilltop which will be to your left now I, I use this map as an example because this isn't necessarily the best route to be chosen. If you take a close look at it, up at the top of the map, you will see a route marker. That's actually, this is a map taken from Laos, by the way back in 1971. And you'll see uh, see that route wind its way past those terrain features uh, in the north. That might be your objective, which is fine. But between you and that road or that highway, you see valleys. Some of them are stream valleys, others are just dry valleys. That's where the enemy is going to be located. The enemy is going to be located where he can get access to a road. He's going to be at, want to locate uh, in rugged terrain features that will that he will use to protect himself from bombing. And he's going to want to be on flat ground, relatively flat ground, or modest gradient. And he's going to be want to be near a stream. So rather than this particular route, maybe you want to 
orient either further east or further west uh, so that you you don't risk coming up and running into the enemy before you want to. Now, the other ways, of course, are taking uh, azimuth from your insertion and you know, go directly to your to the, your area of interest, which occasionally was done by novice uh, team leaders. And that was always a very bad thing to do. Because if the enemy determined that you were walking an azimuth, then he could signal ahead to an enemy to create a blocking force or to set up uh, an ambush or a trap for you. Uh, other ways to navigate would by using dog legs. So take an azimuth and then take another azimuth and then another azimuth. I found that pretty confusing, uh, generally speaking. So this is this is the the land navigation process that I used. Now it, it's really contingent on having coordinates where you are, like for instance, at the insertion point. There are occasions, there were occasions, at least one occasion, when I had a, a Covey rider who couldn't read a map. Uh, one guy in particular, uh, who, uh, the guy didn't even know how to wear a beret for crying out loud. He was an officer and for some reason they, they made him a Covey rider. Normally Covey riders were special forces guys who had experience, who had been on the ground before, uh, who could relate to a you know, a recon team who knew what they were going through, who instinctively would know the correct actions to take in order to do air ground coordination and those kinds of things. This guy had no time on the ground. He was a captain, for crying out loud. Uh, but he had no time on the ground, uh, and certainly in this AOR, very responsible. So I was supposed to be landed in, in an area called Tango 7, uh, and, uh, he landed me on an LZ that was six, six kilometers away from the LZ that I had selected. And it took me because, because of the vegetation, you could not see terrain features around you. And I immediately started getting suspicious and confused and disoriented because I didn't know where, but I knew that I had to move north because that was where my target was. Finally, at some point, I was on a ridge line and there was a break in the canopy. There had been a landslide or something like that, a tree fall. And I looked to my west and there was a major ridge line, a really high ridge line that should not have been in my area of operations, my target area at all. So I called this, uh, I used the radio to, to contact this cover rider and said, where did you put me? He got all insulted and said, uh, where your LZ was. Well, I, I never used that. I insisted that I never use, that that guy would never support me again because the guy couldn't read a map. Unbelievable. Subsequently, when I went to debriefing, it was a very short debriefing because you're supposed to des describe where you were and what you saw. And I said, I don't know. 
I was placed on the wrong LZ. I was disoriented for, for almost the entirety of the trip until I got up on the road. Then I said, oh, now I know where I am. So, so it was quite amazing uh, in all of my conversations with more than just CCC men, uh, CCS and CCN, uh, that they uh, that come across more than one officer in a situation like that they could think about and not wear a beret correctly. <laughs> oh, yeah. This guy would look like a clown. He couldn't wear his uniform correctly. I, oh. I mean, just, he was at it. Uh, what, 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 what can I say? You know, what can this say? speechless. This speechless. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were some disappointments. You, you expect SOG, whether they be uh, teams or company, cadre, or staff, you'd expect them to be have a certain level of excellence. You know, but sometimes you were disappointed. Uh, We've got a pretty good question right here that pertains to what we're uh, what you're talking about or we're just talking about um did y'all walk parallel to ridge lines uh most frequently know? walked on the military crest uh but occasionally if you were being pursued and you had to run the best pay place to be is on a on a ridge top because There are fewer shrubs up there you know, to trip over, and you know, and, and normally animals use ridge tops to to move as well, whether they be migrating animals or not. So there was often a path on a ridge top, so you could move relatively quickly on a ridge top. Okay, so this is the next slide. This is kind of interesting. All right. So this is an inlet, either on a lake or a river. And if you take a close look at this, it will tell you certain essential information. So you know, I, we can't have a participation with the audience here, but I would, I would ask you to think To interpret what you're seeing in this in this photo and what it means in terms of your navigation and how you're going to use this terrain and vegetation to evade the enemy or to to turn the tables on the enemy and the first thing you want to look at is those ducks that are in the water so what's the significance of the ducks The significance is that they're bottom feeders. So that means that you're in shallow water. So you can actually walk across this inlet at this location and your mountain yards are not gonna drown on you. Okay. You also see mud or you see the bottom of the inlet. So you can turn that to good use. You can actually create a ruse. You can use your hands in a kind of, in a form like that to create what looks to be the bow of a boat. Moving into the into the mud and do it in a couple of places so that the enemy who might be tracking you will see, ah, oh, Jesus Christ. They had boats. So then and there, they may give up tracking you because they can't track you across water. The other thing is if you're going to ambush the enemy, this is a lousy place to do it. If you're going to establish the ambush 
in those in that you know that vegetation here because those are all water plants so you, there's no cover there from from automatic weapons fire if you turn around and face the other way though what you're going to see is an inlet will curve around uh, so that you you wind up on the the bank of the lake so if you can convince the enemy that you walk here but then walk a little bit along the inlet and then get back on the bank and come back loop back around and establish uh a an ambush on the back trail that's one way that you can use this water Another thing you can do, though, is you have Claymore mines. So if you're going to put, if you're going to try and use Claymore mine against an enemy, where are you going to put the Claymore mine? You're going to have to suspend it on the on these plants, not up front where it can be seen, but a little further into the into the brush, uh, at above. At about chest level, uh, and string that wire uh, so that it won't be seen. And uh, you know, or have some other initiating device, and the enemy will will expose himself as he comes to that bank. And will you know attempt to find a way to track you? So he's going to expose himself, and that's that's when you you fire off the claymore. But the the claymore is generally designed to be set on the ground using its legs. So if you're going to put a claymore on foliage, on trees or whatever, you're going to have to have something that's you know like bungee cord. To attach it. Okay. I, I guess we, got a, we got a water store uh, question. Uh, uh, did y'all in, in SOG, did y'all ever need or use rubber rafts for any uh, mission? Nothing I'm aware of. Uh, you know, the enemy was all, always. Uh, place their units uh, nearby water for obvious reasons. And some of those waterways were navigable. Uh, so, and they would only navigate those, those navigable waterways, whether it be a lake or a stream or a river during hours of darkness and not broad daylight where they could be detected. Uh, now, I've had to cross rivers to evade an enemy. Uh, and it wasn't a pleasant feeling. You felt as though you were being observed. Fortunately, I wasn't being observed because had the enemy been observing me, they could have wiped out my entire team. Just one guy with an AK could have wiped out my entire team. But I, I had really no choice. Uh, I was being pursued by an enemy who was particularly adept, highly skilled. I did it. I pulled every trick in the book. Uh, and the only thing that I could think of was crossing the stream and trying to you know, get him to cross it, to follow me. Even that didn't work, but uh, no. So boats were not were not used uh, in Laos, to my knowledge. I don't think anybody used them uh, from Sog. Any there, other questions? Uh, there, uh, there was one more for the water before we go to the next slide. Uh, I know uh, Sandy Hernandez was involved with a. a quote-unquote scuba rescue mission, but 
were were any of you at CCC uh, involved in any scuba or waterborne operations uh, like that? Uh, most guys in SOG were not uh, scuba qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, in underwater operations course in Fleming Key when I got orders for SOG. I had already gone past the harassment swim. The rest of the course would, would have been downhill for me. Uh, but uh, I, I had orders to report to, to SOG and I didn't know that I had the option of asking for a delay I'm not sure I would have asked for it anyway because I was really, I really wanted to uh, to run recon and sod. Got that ready. But but I I don't know any. I, I offhand I I didn't know anybody of my peers who were were scuba qualified, especially at that time. I'm sorry, there were very few. Yeah, and I, I don't think it would have been of great benefit anyway. I've, uh, I've got you ready for the next slide. And I think uh, we're coming up uh, this one, depending on how far in depth we get, this could end up being the last slide, the Q&A to, to wind it up. But uh, we'll see. So there's a movement technique, there's a number of movement techniques. So Several of them described in my book. They, they probably A to Z. Uh, the movement techniques that are designed to uh, delay or baffle or destroy an enemy tracker team. We always assumed we had tracker teams, and overwhelmingly that was the case when I was you know, when I ran operations, every time I, almost every time I had uh, trackers on me. Uh, so this is one way. One of several, there's a, others that use a box technique and then there's one that uses dog legs. Uh, what this does is you, you do a loop around a terrain feature. Uh, so the enemy's tracking you at some distance behind you. And then all of a sudden, he's going to notice where the tracks merge, where you've come around a train feature and gotten back onto your uh, the path that you had been on. And he's going to want to know, he's thinking to himself, what the hell is this? Is this another unit? Is this a, like a platoon rather than you know a team? Uh, and he's going to pause and he's going to wonder what the hell's going on here. And he may communicate, uh, with his higher headquarters and say, I don't know, we, we may have a platoon here, you know, and then we'll definitely confuse him. If the timing is right, you might come around to rejoin your back, uh, back trail when the enemy has already passed you by, and then you will be following him, which would be kind of amusing. So this is one of several methods. I don't advocate this necessarily. It's all situationally dependent. Uh, some are better suited uh, for this kind of terrain. Others are more suited to uh, areas where there are streams uh, or swamps and so forth. But in my book, there's a whole laundry list of these kinds of things that I, and every one of them I, I used at one point or another during the roughly 25 missions that I ran. Got time for the next slide? Okay. Yeah. Um, Often, 
you know, a, a TTP is something that you want to vary so you don't set set a, a pattern for the enemy. But fish hooking was almost mandatory. It was seldom. I mean, I could think of only one occasion when I didn't fish hook on a knot. And that was because I was on really very steep terrain. And uh, light was failing, so I, I couldn't move any further. So what this is, is you're moving along uh, a, a your path, and then you loop around so that you can overwatch your back trail. Uh, in the event that the enemy is following you closely, you can ambush him from this perimeter. So the perimeter would be established whether you're going to set up to make commu communications, or you're going to take a meal, or you're going to settle in for the night. Uh, and uh, you would always, always fish hook, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. This is not the most ideal location for that perimeter. Though. The best location for that perimeter would be on the ridge immediately to the west across that ravine where that intermediate stream happens because then you will have a better field of fire and you're going to be able, if the enemy is, is following your trail, you're going to be able to kill, shoot him uh, along his long axis, which is always preferred. Now there's certain actions that you take when you move into a perimeter, one of which is, it's almost drilled in your point, man, you place him where you intend to make your next, your subsequent move. So if this is a night defensive perimeter and you're going to move in the same direction, which would be generally west, northwest, that's where you, that, that's where you're going to place your point man on the perimeter. And then everybody else will fall in according to their, how they line up in a file formation. Uh, next thing you're going to do is you're going to, you as the team leader are going to go outside the perimeter and check to see if there's any signs of enemy activity. So you're going to go on top of this ridge and you're going to see if there's any trail up there. You're also going to look for routes of approach. So there could be other trails that are actually crossing the ridge east to west or west to east. You want to find those. Uh, if you don't, I mean, it's a number of junior team leaders got caught short by not checking their perimeter. Always, you always have to check. Once the perimeter is checked, then you come back to the perimeter, and there's a process for that: how you exit and how you how you leave. So, for instance, before you exit, you're going to tell the team, "I'm going to look around," and you give them instructions using hand and arm signals: how long you're going to be gone, where you're going to go, uh, and uh, and if you get attacked, if you get ambushed or while you're away, what they're supposed to do or what you will do, what they're supposed to do if they get attacked. So, I mean, all those instructions are delivered very quickly. Uh, so you will point out to them during that process, your RP, your a reference point, a rally point, where they're they're going to, you know, where you expect them to rendezvous and wait for reassembly of the team if they get separated. 
Uh, so you come back to to the perimeter, and then you you tell the, the team to deploy Claymore mines. All this is always re, has been rehearsed. It's second nature to the people. They know exactly where to place them. Typically, uh, for a, a 12-man recon team or less, uh, you know, an eight to eight to 12-man team, you're going to place four claymores around your perimeter. If you're going to be hit by an enemy while you're in perimeter, it is almost given yeah. that he's going to hit you in the morning as you as you're getting organized to move out. If he's lucky, you will already have re recovered your claymores. But that is, so that's the ideal time for him to, uh, to attempt to overrun your perimeter or to inflict casualties on you is at dawn or close to dawn. Okay, I mean that sums sums that up. Uh, and yes. got... uh, it looks like uh, we're hitting our uh, we're a little bit over our time, but uh, this will be the perfect time to wrap up, wrap it up with a Q and A. And uh, part three will be. Uh, I think we can squeeze it in on part three. Uh, it, it, although the, the next last parts of the slide are going to be heavily uh, in depth. So. Uh, but I'll uh, go ahead and get to the questions real quick. Um, one of them I'm not too familiar with. Uh, I know the, it, I, I think it's a hatchet force mission because he mentions pulling it, and that was the early uh, nomenclature for the hatchet forces. But to your knowledge, have you heard of any Havoc or Hornet force missions or heard of them? You'd be curious to know about any. Uh, and I guess. To kind of answer that would be uh, Joe Carnard's books, those slam operations. You could really look look into that and and get those questions asked or answered by that. Uh, yeah, those, those terms aren't typically you know very familiar to me. I mean, before SOG was established, it was preceded by a couple of uh, uh, units out of Fifth Special Forces Group. Uh, one was called uh, Project Sigma, and the other one was called Project Omega. One dealt with uh, reconnaissance operations in Laos, and the other one dealt with, you know, Cambodia. But on, but uh, Americans in those organizations actually did not accompany, did not lead teams. Those were teams that they trained from indigenous personnel, whether they're Vietnamese or Montagnard, and sent them in, into those areas. That was very unsatisfactory because the information was very unreliable. I can tell you reasons why that was. Maybe we can reserve that as a, uh, a follow-up on the next uh, podcast. Uh but uh, before uh, before I got there, which was in early '69, so let's say in 1968, recon teams were called spike teams, uh, and I don't know why that term was used, and I don't know why they changed it to recon team. Uh, and I assume that uh, company operations and platoon size operations also had a, a, a different appellation, a different name as well. Uh, as to havoc and, and whatnot, uh, those terms aren't familiar familiar to me. Yes. I don't know if they were call signs. They might have been call signs. I don't know. I think it was uh, much like the spike team uh, name change. I think there for a while they were uh, the hatchet force or exploitation, depending if you were CCS. I think they went by foreign uh, forces. So, 
but uh, we've got a, a good one about the, uh, the a good question about fish hook. Um, did you uh, fish hook before uh, the, the team would set up the RON? Uh, yeah, the me? RON is, is like a night defensive perimeter. So uh, always, uh, unless the circumstances were unusual. Um, so the, 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 the typical process would be you would have to make communications twice a day. So you wake up in the, in the morning uh, out of your night defensive perimeter. And you, you move from there for much of the morning until around 11 a.m. Then you start looking for a place to establish another perimeter for communications. You don't want to communicate uh, from the same place where you're going to later lay up. You know, so, but at any rate, one of the things that we would do was we would not only establish communications, but we would also eat our noon meal. But when we moved out from that, We would have two separate fish hooks prior uh, to nightfall. One was to establish a, a perimeter for communications and to eat. And then you move from there because you're, you have a signature. You, the enemy had uh, uh, direction finding equipment. So he could generally locate depending on where his, uh, his antenna were located, he could, he could pretty much figure out where you were if he had that equipment. But you would also leave trace through the aroma of the food that you were consuming. So you didn't want to stay there for, in your night defensive per perimeter. So you had to make your communications, eat your meal, and then move again to, before nightfall so that you had enough light there to establish your perimeter look around your perimeter make sure you're you're not in jeopardy and also leave yourself enough time that if if you found that you were uh, too close to an enemy to any activity you might want to move your perimeter so uh, you you want to establish your night perimeter, your night defensive perimeter prior to nightfall around the dusk time frame. So. Uh, there's a, another good question that uh, kind of involves uh, the, the RON as well. Um, what would be uh, your in place? Would you in place the heavy weapons, your RPDs and such uh, in a particular uh, manner during the RON? My 12-man team had three fire teams of four men each. Okay. Uh, sometimes I, I had to deploy with less than that, so like eight men, whatever. The team leader would typically be in the middle, uh, and the radio man would be close enough where I could reach him, you know, tap him on the shoulder or whatever. Uh, what I favored was I would have a, a three-man element at each part of the perimeter if we were being hotly pursued in particular. Because then that would allow you to have all night listening post available. Two guys would be awake, one guy would sleep. And then they would rotate periodically during the night when when a guy started getting tired, he'd wake up the guy who was sleeping and they they'd swap. Uh 
as to you know placement of weapons, I carried a machine gun. My, all my cruiser, I had abundance of cruiser weapons. I had a mortar. I had two RPG light machine guns. I had an RPG launcher. Uh, and I had two guys. I, I, my tail gunner was armed with a M16 rifle with rifle grenade rifle as a, as a grenade launcher. And I had two 40 millimeter, uh, underslung M203s under, uh, car 15s. So I had plenty of firepower to support all around the perimeter. But if I had to place a, uh, you know, the heavier weapons, uh, they would be where they would have overwatch over the back trail. So the second RPD, I carried one. My assistant team leader carried another. He would be a, have overwatch with the RPD. Also part of his team was an RPG launcher. So he would have two cruiser weapons. We've uh, we've got one time for one more, uh, so we don't push it too long. And um, just to uh, go ahead and mention it, we'll uh, with some of the questions I've gotten now and previously, we're definitely going to have to speak about um, how you got the RPD and a little bit about uh, some of the stories on why you chose the RPD. People are very interested in that, but um, for. Uh, Guys, I'm, I've got the questions written down, but for uh, the last question on the screen, uh, since we're talking about ROINs and uh, and uh, fish hooks and all that, how often uh, were you guys checking to see if the plane marks had been altered or turned around while y'all were there? No problem about that. Wow. The field manual and technical manuals regarding the claim were give you a safety distance between where your firing position is and where the claim was located. Ignore that. That didn't apply. Typically, the, the claim wars would be placed on one side of the tree, up a tree, and the guy who controlled it was on the opposite side of the tree. It was not possible for somebody to get that close and, and turn the claim war around because we're talking about a matter of two or three meters. Uh, so that wasn't a problem. Uh, the, the claimers were always deployed very close to where we were located. And it, an interesting little story is before I was team leader, my team, team leader of RT New York was a guy by the name of John St. Martin. We were in a target area called Hotel Nine. We were being tracked uh, by an enemy uh, squad, at least a squad. Uh, and uh, we were in the uh, we were in a perimeter when the enemy came up on us. The point man that we had spotted them, and he opened fire immediately which was normally the signal. Anytime anybody opened fire, it was also the signal for, for everybody to detonate the claymores. Three claymores went off. One did not. We had a new Mont yard on the team. And he turned around to the interpreter and basically said, should I fire the, the claymore? Well, it turns out that John St. Martin was standing literally one foot away from the back of the claymore. Uh, and uh, when that claymore went off, St. Martin literally did a 360 degree flip and landed it back on his feet. And then continued to directing the team uh, to uh, towards the uh, a path of departure. That taught me a lesson 
that uh, if you're in a really hazardous situation, uh, you should take safety precautions with a grain of salt. I mean, what's the greater hazard? An enemy uh, squad or platoon coming up on you or risking secondary fragments from, you know, a claymore. So he suffered, John St. Martin suffered no injury whatsoever. I did though, I got a punctured eardrum because I was literally, uh, you know, a, uh, a foot away from John. Uh, and I was in the same back blast area as well. We got since right and another reason uh we're gonna have to get into your y'all's mad uh invention with the RPG in an episode, but to close it out, guys, I, I hate it. We're gonna this will be the last question. Um those that get in we'll, we'll do on part three. But um with you already answered uh, how far away the concept of the claim wars, but uh, did you have any tricks with the claim wars? Would you ever put Willie Pete near them or, or get CS on them, or would you just rock the, the claim wars? Never, never used Willie Pete. Uh, the white phosphorus grenade was a heavy grenade, and it was absolutely essential uh, as a marking device to penetrate triple canopy. So I didn't waste white phosphorus. Uh, there's nothing that a white phosphorus grenade could do that a claymore couldn't in terms of inflicting uh, casualties on an enemy. But I did put bags of CS powder in front of the claymore. Uh, I found that that was marginally uh, effective. I, I only use it a couple times because the CS powder itself would often be consumed in in the uh, in the heat of the explosion. Uh, I did resort to kind of a I, we really had an odd sense of humor, uh, a dark humor in SOG. Now, for twenty four of the twenty five months that I was in recon, I had intestinal parasites. I would go to the dispensary. They determine what kind of parasites I had, what combination of parasites I had. They would give me the medication. I would take the medication. I would be cured. And then the next day, I would have another suite of parasites. Uh, at some point, so when I go to the uh, go to the woods, I didn't want to you know, stop and expose myself, you know, taking the dump in the woods with the frequency, you know, with diarrhea all the time. So they had a medication that was called Lamotil. Uh, and that was a very effective in uh, corking you up. But at some point, after eating a certain amount of meals, the urge to defecate was impossible to stop. So if we were in a, uh, in a perimeter, I would go out right on the opposite side of a claymore and take a big mess of crap right in front of the claymore. <laughs> uh, in the hopes that the enemy would come up, maybe even attracted by the aroma and that he would get splattered if he didn't get killed. You know? <laughs> and let me tell you, the uh, the crap that I took was a seething pile of goo. You could actually see worms in it. So it was a nasty mess. <laughs> and uh, I stopped doing that, though, because I thought it was demeaning to my monyard, you know, that he had to go and recover the claymore and, and, and see that big pile of shit. <laughs> so I, I stopped doing that after a while. Yeah. That, 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 uh, right there is, uh, 
that's that's a uh, good psychological warfare right there. As uh, Miller said, that's a shitty way to go. Um, well, it looks like we are on. We'll be starting starting slide twenty two of thirty four. Um, uh, next on part three. Um, and uh. I appreciate the questions. I've written down the ones we did not get to today. We're going to keep it uh, pretty concise. Um, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, is there anything else you would like to add for today? Uh, no, I appreciate the questions. Some of them are, uh, are uh, pretty uh, pretty good questions, actually, insightful questions. So uh, oh, yeah. I, I appreciate the give and take, and I hope uh, – that you're getting something out of it. I don't know if there's any among you who are um, active duty or reserve military where this would benefit you if we ever get into, uh, you know, uh, other engagements, no matter where they occur. I would also suggest to you that all these TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures just don't apply to rainforest or jungle. Uh, they can be employed uh, anywhere, literally. So uh, don't be confused that these are, you know, only for jungle ops or you know, operations and in, in rainforest. I've showing that uh, your your book covers every known land feature that you can probably discover out the wild in on any other operations mountains desert all, you know it's all in there and i and, have added a link to the script in the description to colonel walcott's book in case none of you have got any of you uh are willing to pick it up if y'all haven't gotten it yet which i hope you have yeah the, the, those that those uh ttps are in Quite a lot of detail. So a lot of your questions will be answered by reading the book. All right. You're, well, you're not going to find those things. You're not going to find those TTPs in uh, in field manuals. You just won't. No, not at not at all. I've, like I told people in my post, uh, it, it is the most comprehensive tactics, techniques, and procedure books, including the the ones. Uh, that are floating around, Mr. Nolan put together. Uh, this is a, 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 a almost a college textbook. Well, I've got it right here. I've going through today. Uh, it's highly, highly put together. It's a wonderful book. So go in the description and uh, get yourself or any friends, like Colonel Walkoff said, Lieutenant Colonel Walkoff said, we got friends that are active duty or, uh, or planning to join the military, this would be an absolute uh, godsend for them uh, with what we're uh, facing. Yeah, I should also mention that uh, the stock has run low for the hardback editions, so you can get it in the digital version. Uh, but the uh, it's going to go into its third printing uh, fairly soon, but I don't know how quickly those books will be shipped from the printer. Uh, some hard, hard bounds may, may still be available. Last I checked, there was still a few copies floating around on Amazon and then uh, some of the other pages. Uh, so I, I know there are still floating around. Uh, Y'all are going to get out. Of it. Yeah, the U.S. distributor here in the uh, is uh publishes their own line of books it's called casemate and uh, casemate is the u.s distributor for my publisher who is uh out of the uh, united kingdom and he said their stock is running really low so i don't know what that means in terms of the actual number of copies but uh, well, I would imagine after these two, uh, and as a matter of fact, guys, I'll go ahead and update you. Uh, last I checked, we've had, uh, I think, a, a thousand T 
10 or 1,020 views uh, on part one. So I feel pretty sure some of those 1,000 uh, have contributed to uh, the low number of books uh, being available right now. So, uh, and I can only imagine that this one will do the same. We're getting a lot of good feedback. Folks are glad that you uh, are talking and answering questions like that. Uh, so I can only imagine how this one will be part three. Yeah, I've got a I've got a second book in in the mill, uh, which I'm working on currently, uh, and uh, I'm under contract to uh, to the UK publisher for that. Uh, and if I can get the the manuscript done by November, then it'll be out probably late spring of next year. This is not going to be about special reconnaissance, although there's going to be some in there about it because I, I could only get so much information into the first book. There's some other information that, that didn't make it into that first edition, but it's going to be about unconventional warfare. There's guerrilla warfare and partisan warfare. And uh, the timing of that is, uh, is pretty good if you think, if you believe that uh, uh, Ukraine may have to resort to unconventional warfare if they are not successful in offensive operations, uh, if, the, if Russia prevails uh, during this war and this conflict that they have. But in particular, uh, it would, a book on UW would be very, helpful in the Indo-Pacific region, which is very much like in terms of geography and vegetation, like uh, Southeastern Laos was to us. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I'm, I've been in doing a lot of research on UW and partisan warfare. There's a lot out there. Uh, but again, I'm focusing on detailed TTPs designed to help uh, units survive, help them become more lethal, and help them, you know, accomplish their, their missions. So with that, thanks again. Yep, we'll, we'll all be uh, looking forward to it. And I'll, uh, as I find out more, guys, I'll... Uh, keep you informed as the progress of on uh weekend Colonel Walcroft's uh book and uh we'll uh we'll keep all informed uh he, he's gonna be busy uh coming up so it may be a little bit of time for part three but we won't keep you all waiting too long but uh I hope you all have a wonderful day and uh Mr. Ed do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh we'll close out done. All righty. Well, guys, uh, we thank you all for joining, uh, participating and doing such great, uh, giving us great questions. Those who didn't get answered, like I said, will be answered in part three. And um, I'll keep you abreast of that when it comes, uh, when we get nailed down. And we will uh, see you all in part three. Y'all have a good day. And uh, whenever y'all watch this, have a good evening. See y'all.